Welcome back, psychologists. I'm your professor, Ryan Keith, and this is the first installment of what I'm calling Right Now, a video about social psychology and what's happening with us, well, right now. Now, this might not be a great way to start off a video called Right Now, but I want to start off by talking about March. Back in March, the United States, and the state of Florida in particular, saw a situation that nobody could have anticipated. A rise in coronavirus cases, something that wasn't even on my radar until February, a rise in coronavirus cases that outpaced anyone's expectations, and as a result, we went on lockdown, we took measures that we would have thought unthinkable before. Everyone, just about, was asked to not go to work, not have fun, stay home, and not interact with anyone in hopes of nipping this thing in the bud. <sighs> Needless to say, things didn't turn out exactly as we had hoped. Florida, contrary to the CDC's guidelines, opened early for business and for play. And now we're in a situation where in the past week, Florida has, had, has added tens of thousands of cases of coronavirus. In fact, I remember the Miami Herald last week saying that in the last week, they had added a third of all of the cases ever diagnosed in the state of Florida. So right now we are in a situation where the cases being diagnosed are double what was being diagnosed in March. You might say that it's in part due to increased testing or maybe it's all those pesky youngins not listening to the guidelines. But the result is we are in a situation where you might expect we should be taking the measures that we took back in March. And yet, I wanna show you guys here the park by my house. I woke up to an announcement this morning from one of my neighbors that no matter what the government said, we were going to have the Independence Day party to end all Independence Day parties this coming Saturday. That it didn't matter what anyone complained about, what anyone said, that we shouldn't bother calling the police because they wouldn't come out here anyway. And in the end, it didn't matter because we were doing this because we loved America and freedom. And rather than being castigated for his remarks, every comment seemed to express greater enthusiasm, greater spirit, greater love for our nation than the one beforehand. Why is it that when this deadly virus is even more dangerous than it's ever been, that rather than taking steps backward to where we used to be to try to control the virus and get us on a uh, trend toward progress, we are instead taking steps forward toward more op opening, or as we've seen even at Santa Fe, the very best we can do is to simply press pause on making things uh, more open. A lot of people are confused about why this is. Uh, uh, talking with my own mother, she simply concludes that Florida must be full of morons. And I might tend to agree that Florida is full of morons, but that's only because the whole world really is full of morons. If we look at things through the lens of social psychology, the situation we're in is not only not surprising, it's instead inevitable. How did we end up in the situation we ended up in today? Well, there are a few reasons for this. One of the big reasons for this, not surprisingly, is that Florida is a state whose economy is based on tourism. People need to go out and do things in order for the economy in Florida to survive. Uh, a lot of states like California uh, are based on similar kinds of economies, but uh, also have big tech sectors or production sectors where people might be able to work from home, and a lot of stuff can be produced autonomously. There's been a ton of pressure on elected officials and business owners to open up as soon as possible and push the limits as much as they can. But there are other elements to this too, things that are unique to our position in particular in the Southeast and in the Deep South. You see, we haven't had a chance to talk about culture in this sense before, but in the Deep South, people are particularly individualistic. What this means is we think about ourselves in terms of who we are, not who we're connected to. And one of the key things about individualism is distinctiveness. We want to be unique, distinct individuals, and in particular, we want to be able to do what we want to do. This week, we're talking all about social influence, the comparisons between obedience, persuasion, and conformity. One of the things that parents and teachers go crazy about is that they want their kids to do what they're told, to simply be obedient. But the problem with this is that people don't like to be obedient. Generally speaking, in individualistic cultures, when we're asked to be obedient, we tend to fall prey to a, a thing called psychological reactance, meaning that we push back. Being told what to do, in fact, makes us want to do the opposite. So what did Americans do when they were told that they needed to stay home and do nothing? Why? 
they tried to do everything they could. Don't go out and buy, buy toilet paper. We're going to buy all the toilet paper we can. And in fact, in a state in the southeast, like Florida or Texas, right? The bastion of individualism more than any other place. People will not only break the rules willingly, but they'll then turn to social media and advertise their breaking of the rules as if it's some sort of badge of pride to wear because it's part of being an individualist. This is a problem then because of conformity. Because if you look around and see a lot of people in this individualistic way breaking the rules, it might sound silly that people who are individualistic then conform, but you look around and in the sense of normative conformity, you see that everybody else is out doing stuff. You say, well, why am I the moron sitting at home doing nothing? I see lots of people out there doing stuff. Nobody's getting sick. Why should I have to do it? It's kind of like if you find out that nobody else flosses their teeth, well, then why should you be doing it too? This kind of normative conformity is a really big problem then. The other really big issue is that a threat like coronavirus is something that we simply have a really hard time understanding. There's no specific identifiable victim. It's simply a matter of uh, statistical risk. It's not like having bad guys like Nazis that we can turn against and go to war with. <clears throat> and in terms of who it's risky for, well, even that, are not they're not people that we know. Most of us don't know anyone who's been diagnosed with coronavirus, and even if we did, chances are they haven't died. And even if they did, maybe it's one person. The point is that it doesn't feel very real. We might know that tens of thousands of people just in the United States have now died from coronavirus, and yet that number doesn't really mean a lot. It's not like having a picture of somebody who was shot by a bad guy or attacked in the streets or, or we all know somebody individually. This is something called construal level theory in social psychology. The more abstract something is, the harder it is for us to identify with it, the farther away it feels, and as a result, the less emotionally impactful it is and the less we're willing to listen to it. The last thing here that really matters is what happens when we're trapped at home. I don't have to tell you guys, we've all been trapped at home for months, and you know what that does to your stress level. It raises it incredibly. So what do you do to deal with that, that raised level of stress? Well, it doesn't matter what you'd normally do because now you can. The result then is we have a bunch of people at home who are really stressed out, and they're told by authority figures that they need to you know, stay at home because of this deadly virus. Learning about the deadly virus makes them more stressed, and they don't have any way to cope with it. And so in the end, what they end up doing is coping with it in really unhealthy ways. What does this mean? In the end, what it really means is that, what is it, that uh, a person can be smart, but people are stupid that especially in a state like Florida or in Texas, we should have expected this. We should have expected we were going to open early and that in the end, when the number of cases skyrocketed, that the people who wanted the state open, who never wanted to close in the first place, weren't gonna do anything and still won't. So you may have spaces like this near your home where you know for a fact that people are going to be barbecuing, they're gonna be grilling, they're gonna be partying, they're gonna be setting off fireworks, and they're gonna be celebrating the whole time how they're sticking it to the man while they do it. And then, two weeks later, we're gonna see a skyrocketing in the number of cases. Just because it feels like you're the only dope at home taking care of things the right way while everybody else is being a moron doesn't mean you need to go ahead and join them. Because it may feel like two weeks is a long way off, but we're absolutely gonna see consequences from this. So. Um, this is our last, or our, our, the end of our first installment of Right Now. I'm looking forward to talking to you guys more about what's happening, well, I guess right then, when we do it. In the meantime, if you have questions about what's going on right now, about social psychology, and about how best to deal with people who are going to be grilling in spaces like this one, just reach out and let me know. Stay safe, and I'll look forward to talking to you guys online. Until then, I'm your professor, Ryan Keith, and this is Social Psychology.